Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for listening in this morning. I am Gemma Chubb, and I'm an associate here in Silicon Valley in Field Fisher's office. Um, this morning marks our third foray into the world of webinars. Um, some of you might already know that we've already spoken to you about data subject access requests, um, about the right of erasure, and today we're going to talk about controller to controller arrangements. Now, historically, and perhaps rather simplistically, the starting point for most customer vendor contracts was that the customer was the controller and the processor, the, um, the vendor was the processor. This, this may not have been correct in every situation, but it was certainly the starting point. This isn't the case anymore. We're not gonna go into the reasons for these changes and why there's, we're seeing different trends at the moment, but thankfully, the rather brilliant Phil Lee has done a, a, an excellent article on it recently. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do. You can find it on his LinkedIn page. And what we are going to talk about is the fact that many vendors are now calling themselves controllers. And the fact that some, some controllers are actually enc encouraging their own um, vendors to become or to, to be to characterize themselves as controllers as well. This is generating deal friction, um, some tricky debates and some interesting negotiations. So to talk about some of these issues, I'm joined by my excellent Silicon Valley colleagues. Um, first, we've got Alex DeGay. Alex is an associate here. He's been living out here for just over a year. Um, he's a privacy lawyer and our go-to guys for matters concerning Privacy Shield and DPAs. Morning. He's also the owner of this rather lovely petite kitchen table that we've gathered around today <laughs> in Portrario Hill. Thanks so much for letting us crash, Alex. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, next we have Flick Fisher, who's a director specialising in privacy and digital regulation. Now I'm really going to embarrass her and say that Flick has been named as the youngest of um, the top 40 under 40 for data protection at the moment. She's an English qualified lawyer and she's lived and practiced law out here in the Bay Area for almost five years now. And last but not least, we've got Eldon Takimitu, who's a senior associate in the office. He specializes in privacy and security with particular expertise dealing with BCRs and um, breach management. Eldon is a New Zealand qualified solicitor and barrister, um, and he's worked in Phil Fisher's um, team in London, um, and also as a DPO during his eight years in London before he moved here. So, morning everyone. <laughs> morning, yeah, Eldon. Morning. <laughs> so, as we did in our last webinar, what we've done <coughs> is put our heads together to collate some of the trickier questions that we've come up against over the last few months. Um, as was the case last time, we can't promise to give you the answers to each of these questions because, um, as you'll appreciate, every circumstance is different. But what we hope to do is share our thoughts, our analysis progression, and hopefully arm you not just with the comfort and validation that these are tricky questions, but also with the tools that you will need to, to negotiate um, moving forward. Um, just before we kick off then, as usual, we're going to try and get through as much as we can in 45 minutes. If you've got any questions, please send them over. If we don't get the chance to go th through them, what we'll do is send out written answers afterwards, along with the um, slides and the recording of this session. So without further ado then, over to Alex. Alex, how do you spot the difference between controllers and processors? Thank you, Gemma. Um, well, it doesn't seem like a tricky question. Um, and actually, often you can you can get it quite down to quite some simple principles, but you'd be surprised how much arguing we do about this actual question. Um, comes up a lot in a lot of our DPA negotiations. Um, it depends what kind of contract you start with, and it um, it can cause a lot of friction. Uh, but essentially, the rules are pretty simple. Um, it hasn't changed, so you can find the definitions of controller and processor in Article 4 of the GDPR. They haven't changed since the directive. Um, there was debate when the GDPR was being uh, written that there might be a sort of third um, category of person, but that didn't get through. So we're still stuck with these two. So it's viewed, it's viewed it in quite a simplistic way. You have the controller who decides the purposes and means of processing. And then you've got the processor who basically processes data on behalf of the controller. 
So your key is you have one person, one actor who's making the decisions and the other one who's just following the instructions of the first one. Dead easy. Um, however, it, it's proved to be quite more complicated in practice and things have got a bit more complex in this modern world with new technologies and so on. Uh, the key point actually about controller is really the purposes. So it's really, if you have a decision-making power about why you're doing this or what to do with data, then that makes you a controller. The means to some extent that can be part, that can be part of the instructions, but it's really the purposes is the key to focus on. Um, and, and a key uh, misconception to get clear at the beginning is just to, because you're a controller doesn't mean you automatically have complete free reign to do exactly what you want. You don't always decide all purposes and means. Um, so bear that in mind as we talk about some of the other questions throughout. Uh, and then the other key point I want to get across is that it's a question of fact, not construction. So you can write a DPA following Article 28 and saying, yep, I'm a controller and you're a processor and blah, blah, blah. But actually, if the processor is making decisions about the purposes and means of processing, then in effect, they become the controller. And a regulator will look beyond the contract at the actual um, the actual data processing that's taking place. So it doesn't matter if you're really keen to position yourself as a processor. If you're basically making decisions about that stuff, then you almost you become the controller then. Yeah, I, and I was also just add that kind of as a general rule of thumb and something which is a bit easier to follow is that the more autonomy a service provider has to act, the more likely they are to be a controller. So if they have, for example, free reign to determine which data should be processed, um, which third parties will have access to the data and when um, the data will be deleted and how long it should be retained for. Those are all the types of um, you know, decision making um, you know, scenarios where they're more likely to be a controller than a processor because a processor can only ever act on the instructions of their controller. Cool. Thank you, guys. So we've touched on this already, um, but is every service provider going to be a processor? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, that That's often been the traditional view um, that just because you are providing a service, you must automatically be a processor. So all vendors are processors. Um, and that's not the case. As Gemma mentioned, Phil wrote a good blog about this. Um, I, I put the uh, the link on the final page so you can find it there um, if you manage to stay to the end. Uh, but that, that was more the view under the directive as well, because under the directive, if you remember, um, the controllers were the only ones with any real legal obligations. And all that had to happen was a very simple arrangement in place with a processor where they, you know, they had to what was it, follow instructions and some basic security. That was it. And if you weren't, we didn't have any physical equipment in the EU, you could basically avoid any direct obligations. So a lot of US um, service providers set themselves up as processes to avoid any EU obligations at all. Now, GDPR changes that because, as you're aware, processes have direct obligations for the first time. It doesn't matter where their stuff is physically located. If they're caught by the Article 3 uh, provisions, so they're offering services or tracking behavior, then they are caught as a processor under GDPR. And so then it, it's worth reassessing, well, do we still, are we still a processor and do we still want to be a processor? Um, because if you're caught by GDPR, you might as well, well, it, it's worth questioning whether you want to then be a controller under GDPR rather than a processor. Uh, the compliance burden is reduced, obviously, if you're a processor than a controller, but there are still um, benefits to being a controller in that you then have a bit more control over the data you're processing. You're not bound by the Article 28 terms, which can be pretty restrictive. You know, you have to agree to audit rights, limits on sub-processing and so on. Um, and in reality, a lot of or a lot of uh, companies which position themselves as processes aren't really. So you have this quite contorted contract and it might be worth just reassessing if you actually just admit it and you're a controller, have a different agreement in place. And that gives you um, more flexibility so you could use data for your own purposes, for example, service improvement. Um, in a lot of we see a lot of agreements where uh, control, uh, sorry, processes are 
you know, they want to be a processor because traditionally they were, and now they find that, or they add these clauses where, oh, well, we'll also use our data to conduct analysis or improve our product um, for machine learning and so on. And, you know, you're not allowed to do it. That's not part of the instructions. You can't really do that. Um, you can't really accept an instruction to use the data for your own purpose because then essentially you are taking that controller role. So not every service product is a processor and it's worth reassessing um, if you find yourself in that role, whether it's better to actually position yourself as a controller. I would just say though that you can't, you know, going around trying to cherry pick, I'm a processor, I'm a controller. You've got to do the factual analysis and make yeah. that determination based on the facts and the, the nature of your processing activities and the interaction that you have with your customer or if, if um, you know, you're a vendor. Um, you know, the, the control that you have over all of that data. So it's not just something you could sort of sit around and go, well, I think we'd like to be a processor because it's easier for us to comply with the Article 28 terms. You should be doing that proper analysis and revisiting all of your data processing, which a lot of vendors did in the run up to GDPR. And as a result, we saw a lot of repositioning um, of many vendors in the market. Um, and a lot of people shifting because actually when they looked into their data processing, they realized they weren't a pure processor and they were actually um, more like a controller. And so we had a lot of um, renegotiation of data processing terms in the run up to the GDPR with people kind of shifting to a controller role, which did create a lot of headaches for people because it's, you know, and we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but it is that it's a little bit of a harder sell to customers to reposition yourself as a controller. And we, we will talk through some of that. Yeah, so the roles are becoming a little less clear, which brings us neatly on to next question, Gemma. Yes, one for Eldon, well, to start off with at least. Can a service provider be both a processor and a controller? Thanks, Gemma. Uh, absolutely, they, they can be. Um, so uh, the first point I want to make on this is, is to echo Flick's point, which is that Doing that due diligence and that assessment of what of what the what your service provider does is, is absolutely the key the key starting point um, in any of this. It, it's it's quite clear in the post GDPR era that uh, you can't just treat service provider obligations as, as a completely legal exercise or, or something that's um, you know exclusively for for the contract. Um, but to back to the question. Regardless of what that uh, that assessment throws up, there, there will be situations where your service provider will be acting as a uh, as a controller. So even if they position all of their services as a processor, uh, there'll be there'll be stuff for which that they are they are they are very much a a, a controller. Um, this seems quite an obvious point, but I just want to I just want to make it clear because I, I know that. Certainly some of our clients and some of the people that we've negotiated against have sort of done this big GDPR exercise and they've realized, yep, we're a processor, here's our Article 28 terms, but they haven't thought about the other categories of data where they actually are a, a controller. So the, the type of data I'm talking about here is um, your, your business contact information, so your CRM data. So I might be a processor and I've got a, um, a, a contract with, with Gemma. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm acting as her processor when I want to, you know, spam her employees with, with, you know, marketing about, about my particular company or, or whatever. Not or that we're endorsing spamming. Not, <laughs> not, absolutely Managing not. the relationship. <laughs> um, um, and similarly, when I want to send uh, a bill to, um, you know, Joe blogs at jimmachub.com, um, I'm not acting as as GemmaChub.com's processor uh, when I when I do that. Uh, though those are really basic examples, but there's also um, there's going to be more complex things that bigger organisations need to do. So things like compliance checking, um, you know, for any pre professional services people out there, your your anti money laundering checks, you know, your client stuff, uh, anti bribery and corruption, export controls, any of that sort of due diligence that you need to do on your service provider, you're going to be acting as a as a as a controller for that for that processing, both pre-contract and in life and and post-life. Um, 
I can see the flicks chopping at the bit yeah, to say something. Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think that a quite a good way to think about it is you can kind of divide up the data that you're using purely to provide the service to the customer. And in a usual kind of SaaS cloud environment, that's usually the customer's content. So the stuff they've given you to host within the service or that you might be collecting purely to provide the service to, to the customer. So you'd usually be a processor of that data. All the other information that you're collecting, which Elton has just summarized, you know, the, the, the end user information, the stuff that you need to collect from them to set up the account, to manage the account, um, to do all of that stuff. And it may also, you would be a controller of, and it would also include anything that you are scrape, any data collection that you're um, kind of scraping from the service that relates, for example, to the usage and performance of the, of the service, if you're using it for things like product improvement, benchmarking, to generally improve the support provided across the service. So there's a distinction between the data you're using purely to service customer A, as opposed to the data that you're then using to service all of your customer base. Because at that point, you're not just acting on the instructions of customer A, you're using it to generally service everybody on the customer base or to manage that relationship with your customers. And at that point, you're determining the purposes, the how, you know, the why the data is being processed and the means. Um, and so you would become a controller of that. But it isn't, the next interesting question is, you know, how do you then deal with that in the contract, which I think we're going to talk about. Um, but yeah, it, uh, that's how I would always break it up. Eldon, just to move, before we move on to the next question, you touched on professional services a bit, and that leads me to think that well, I, I personally always view people in professional services, auditors, accountants, lawyers, I'd never say they were actually processors at all, even mm -hmm. when they are servicing their client relationship. Um, and the main reason for that is that you're a regulated entity and actually you have to use your own discretion. Um, you aren't only answerable to your client. Do you guys agree with that? Generally, yes, but I think that at least the four of us um, have had the benefit of coming through the the UK uh, system, and and, and the, the the British regulator has a very uh, convenient piece of guidance in which it clearly says that accountants, mm. legal services providers, professional services um, are, are controllers because because as you point out, they they're ex exercising that expertise and and how how a certain piece of data need how a set of data needs to be needs to be processed uh, but what i will say on that is that that um, it, it's it's a developing area and that that sort of clear cut view which has been held um, in the uk and other other regulators as well throughout europe that professional services providers are um, our controllers it isn't quite isn't quite clear cut and it's not held it's not held by everyone and so i think the the key thing when you're engaging a professional services provider um, is i think with like all of this to, to put them through whatever due diligence processes you have and actually look at at the services that are being provided because i think that particularly in, in the modern market there are services out there that law firms that accountants are, are providing which which could well be processor yeah. services. I think Eldon's spot on and there is, so as well as the UK guidance, there is some discussion of this in the Article 29 Working Party um, opinion in, from 2010, which is worth looking into, looking at actually, because it talks in more depth about how to think through the issues of controller versus processor. But it kind of makes a distinction between if, for example, um, you engage an accountant to prepare my tax return and just go and do it, at that point, the accountant has got full control over what data it needs to collect to, to do that um, and, you know, is exercising all of its professional judgment. So it's very much determining the means and the purposes of processing. But there may be scenarios where you get an instruction from, say, an in-house accountant who is very much like controlling exactly how that audit should be run by the third party accountant and at that point this guidance sort of suggests there may be more of a processor role so as Ellen says it's very much dependent on how you've set up that arrangement and the level of autonomy basically the professional service provider has to act but, and it it can evolve can't it as well because yeah. the instruction can be find me a you know you can get a, like a broker arrangement find me this provider and then engage them and the finding might involve a lot of autonomy and in that sense they're controlling but then the actual engagement is like you instruct this person to do this thing um and i don't know if you covered it but you were were we going to talk about like some more complex arrangements like payment services where 
there's, there's certain types of data you'll be a controller and other types you'll be a processor and it's 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 definitely not clear you have to break it down because you can't just say you're a processor because then you say well no i'm not i'm a controller and actually you have to figure out well actually for this set of data that we're sending you and you're autonomous you are a controller but then for this other set you're you're purely processing so it can get a bit yeah. messy yeah. but again it's based on the actual facts of the data transfers and what you're doing with it I, and i think you're right i say financial services you think <laughs> <laughs> Uh, He's spot on. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're correct. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> financial services are, are a good example because I think, particularly if you're a big organisation working on you know big sophisticated dealings with financial services agencies, there's um, you know their wing their wing that provides payment services may very well be a controller, but other you know other other services that that um, financial institution provides you may well be be very much processor services so i think mm -hmm. fs is is one uh, but oh sorry we're getting the hurry up from <laughs> from jim and Chad we've, we've got a we've lot spent to too long on this topic. Yeah. well it um, sounds like um and actually we already knew this but the subject of professional <laughs> services um and the controller to controller or controller processor relationship can probably take up a webinar in itself. But because of time, moving on um, to the next question, we've got controllers, joint controllers, independent controllers, and controllers in common. What's the difference? All right, so uh, I think my view is joint controllers, this is something new that's been set up. It's mentioned in GDPR. Um, there's a specific article about it, number 26 it says you have to have an arrangement in place i think the, the the key there is there's some kind of unified purpose so it's a joint venture uh it's it's two companies coming together with a joint marketing campaign it's two local local authorities having the same project with a single common goal hmm. um independent controllers uh that's something different it's where there are two controllers there's still the same data set but they basically have different purposes. They're not trying to achieve the same thing. They're trying to do their own thing, but with the same data. But there's some overlapping responsibilities because there may be only, say, one way of getting to the data subjects. Um, but essentially, they're, they're, they're kind of doing their own thing. Um, yeah, and there might be an instructing party and a subservient one, but essentially they are both controllers um, with their own goals. Um, I, yeah. I was I was just going to say um, that term control is in common. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say, Alex, we can basically ignore that. Yeah. In, in the new world now, um, yeah. it was it was an old ICO term, which on our read essentially means joint controller. Yeah, and and actually we. It's worth specifying the difference between a joint controller and independent controller because they're now understood. I actually thought controls and com was independent, yeah, but yes. it's kind of it's out of use. I was testing it. All right, well, <laughs> yeah. I guess I passed. Well done, you passed the test. Phew, this is high pressure with you two around. Well, but but I, I, you don't see it very often, whereas control independent control is more used. I think the problem is the the um, the reason I mention UK versus EU here is that I'm not sure how many other jurisdictions had this concept of either controllers in common or independent controllers. Um, it's certainly something we use often in the UK, but I get do get pushback from some European, um, other European jurisdictions where they say, well, what are you talking about? Like, I'm a process, you're a controller. And you say, no, we're both controllers. Oh, you mean joint controllers? Say, no, I don't, I mean this other thing. Um, so I think it's still, it's not universally accepted, but it definitely makes sense in a lot of the arrangements we've been <laughs> talking about. Well, yeah, yeah, not understood. <laughs> you have to argue about it, but, for the reasons we've been talking about, it does make sense. You're not always going to be a controller and processor, and you're not always going to be the joint controllers as understood under GDPR, because you're not necessarily doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the way, so, you know, two controllers sharing data are not, as, as Alex has already said, they're not automatically um, joint controllers. Uh, in most cases, they will be separate controllers. So joint controller is a more of a rare scenario, because it's really, it arises when two parties are effectively acting together to achieve an end goal. Um, and it doesn't have to be a kind of perfectly equal split of um, responsibilities, um, but it has to be that there's some, um, you know, level of cooperation between the two controllers to to determine how and why the data is going to be processed. So I think a really good a sort of practical example of when you might get a joint controller relationship might be, for example, if, if two controllers are doing some kind of joint research or market research or survey, 
So um, the client could specify the budget and the scope of the, uh, scope of the survey, for example, the topic they want covering and, and the customer sample. Um, but if the client leaves it up to the service provider to determine the sample size, the interview methods, um, the survey questions and, and the presentation of the survey report at the end, um, although the client is kind of, although that service provider is processing on the client's behalf. The service provider here, the survey, um, you know, the, the service provider who's managing the survey is also making really key decisions over how that information is collected and the manner in which the survey is being carried out. So in that circumstance, it could be said to be joint controllers because they're both working to determine the purposes and the means of the processing there. And there's a clear collaboration. Yeah, and it, it's definitely worth, we often, we, well, we always um, specify which, and if you are in an independent control relationship, make sure that's clear in whatever document you have and that you specify that in fact you're independent and not joint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Um, so this is moving slightly away from the identity of the players um, and towards um, the actual contract terms. What are the key things that need to be in place in the contract between two controllers? Yeah, so this is an interesting one because the GDPR does not actually mandate the terms that have to go into a controller to controller um, arrangement. Um, so unlike in a controller to processor scenario where article Article 28 has this kind of long list of terms that have to be addressed in the contract. Um, the parties are effectively free to agree commercially between themselves what terms will be addressed in a controller to controller scenario because the GDPR is silent. The only times at which, in which the GDPR steps in to kind of say that the parties need to put in place some kind of arrangement is if you are in a joint controller scenario. And if you're in a joint controller scenario, Article 28 steps in and says that the 26, sorry, 26, uh, must enter into some kind of arrangement, and it doesn't say a contract, so unlike Article 28, which says it has to be a contract, if you're in a joint controller arrangement, Article 26 says that you've got to enter into some kind of arrangement that um, stipulates each party's um, respective responsibilities for addressing GDPR compliance, because remember, you're jointly responsible for that compliance. Um, and so in a joint controller arrangement, you would have to have a contract that kind of allocate, well, an arrangement, and I kind of think that the easiest way to do that is to have some kind of contractual agreement between the parties that allocates each party's responsibility for addressing some of the key compliance actions. So that means, you know, who's going to be dealing with data subject rights? Who's Who's going to be addressing the transparency obligations um, and the other way in which that arrangement could kind of manifest is well if you if you're each responsible for kind of dealing with data subject requests and making sure that you've got transparency i notice to individuals about how the processing uh, is happening and the data involved maybe to have some kind of joint privacy statement or notice because the other thing that you've got to make sure is that you're making um you know that arrangement available to data subjects um, so some kind of accessible form um, or notice that data subjects can easily kind of review to see the details of that arrangement. And the other thing that you've got to do is that, well, it, it's not an absolute obligation, but um, you've got to make sure or, or potentially offer some kind of single point of contact for data subjects. And the GDPR is a bit kind of vague and says that you may offer a single point of contact for data subjects. So that's left for the parties to um, agree that in the arrangement that's been in place. Um, but leaving joint controllership aside, if you're just in a, in a standard independent controller to independent controller arrangement, although the GDPR doesn't say that you have to have any terms in place, there are nonetheless really good commercial reasons to put in place and document how the arrangement is going to work in practice between you. Um, and in many cases, if you're the first controller that is sharing, for example, data with a second controller, you will want to make sure that that recipient controller effectively remains a good actor. So although they may, they will be independently responsible for addressing their compliance obligations, if you, for example, as the first controller have been the one fronting it with the data subject, you would want to make sure that when you then share it with that controller, um, that they commit to certain basic obligations like they will process that data in compliance with the law, um, they will protect it with appropriate security. Um, and then also you may want to think, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in subsequent slides, you might want to think about scoping the use rights that that recipient controller may have 
um, in relation to that data. So defining the permitted purpose of use that that recipient controller will be subject to. Because if you, as the one who maybe have provided notice to the individuals, have said, we will never sell your data, we will never share it with third parties for anything other than these purposes in our privacy notice, you want to make sure that you, you stand behind those commitments that you've made. And so you make sure that that recipient controller doesn't go beyond those use cases. Um, so think about what you've what you've said downstream if you're the sharing controller what, what have you told data subjects what have you maybe committed to downstream with other controllers in terms of the scope of use rights around that data and so you may need to contractually keep and flow those down to other controllers and um, you may also want to think about what happens if you get a data subject request if the data subject goes to the recipient controller um, and actually the data subject request relates to the processing that was done by the original controller, you might want to have terms in place that say please direct those requests direct to us so we can make sure that we deal with them. Um, and the other thing to think about is don't forget about data transfers. So even in a controller to controller scenario that the GDPR doesn't mandate terms. The only thing that it does do is if you are sharing between controllers, you cannot forget about data export issues. So the same rules apply between controllers to controllers. If you're transferring data outside of the EU to a non-adequate country, you need to have a data export mechanism in place. And so that would be the controller to controller model clauses is the most common, or if the recipient is privacy shield, make sure you're getting commitments in there that they'll protect it in line with their privacy shield commitments. Yeah, just to pick on one thing that you mentioned, um, notice, you, were you anticipating there that where there is, say, a frequent and customary controller to controller relationship, that you're anticipating that parties may work together to make sure that their notices are aligned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we're going to, we're going to, there's, there's a specific question on that in Slide a, a few slides, Jack. Ah, sorry, I was um, um, So I don't want to jump the gun on that one. But yes, there's got to be, you know, if you're a behind the scenes service provider, which we're going to talk about, so you don't have a direct interface with the underlying data subjects, but you do have an independent obligation to still provide notice. And if you're relying on consent as your lawful ground to get consent if you don't have that direct interface you're ultimately reliant on your your contractual arrangement with the other controllers to try and get them to do that for you but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more the only other thing i would raise is liability so in a joint controller arrangement to just remember that even though you may have said you controller a are actually going to deal with data subject requests the data subject doesn't have to follow what the contract says. So they could come against any one of those controllers, uh, uh, irrespective of what the contract says, and say, I want to enforce my right of access against you, controller B. I don't care what the contract says. And that controller B would have to kind of address that um, and work together with the other controller. Um, and, the other, and the other thing is that effectively, the two joint controllers end up being jointly and severally liable to a data subject. So that means data subject can go against, again, controller A for all of their loss and damage. And then controller B would effectively have to rely on what's sort of like a statutory indemnity to kind of claim back their losses from the other controller to the extent they've been responsible. So you may want to deal with some of these issues in the contract as well to make sure you can recover as much as you can um, for, you know, if, if you haven't been responsible for the loss. Um, so I think that brings us quite neatly onto the next question. Um, which is, so can you actually restrict what the other controller does with the data? Yeah, the short answer is yes. And I, I get a lot of um, a lot of the deal friction that I see um, arise from controller to controller deals comes from the first controller being really scared about you know, allowing another controller full free reign over the data that they're sharing with them. Because there's this almost misconception that you can't um, sort of agree between you restrictions on how the data is used and that's absolutely not the case and in fact if you are a, 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 you yourself a service provider that is a controller I think one of the main ways you can help reduce some of that fear around that your customers may have about agreeing to controller to controller terms it's a really clearly defined in the contract the permitted purposes for which you're going to use the data because that provides that customer with a lot more assurance that you're basically not on some kind of data land grab and you're not going to go and sell the data and all the things that they fear about kind of relinquishing control to another controller. So yes, I think those are the sorts of things that you would agree between you commercially. And the other thing I would also say about that is I often hear or see that there's a real confusion over the IP issues and the privacy issues. So even if you don't own the IP in the data, 
So you've got it under a license. It doesn't mean that you can't be a controller. So the assessment over IP rights and um, the issue over whether or not you're a controller in fact or not are not, you know, are kind of separate discussions. Um, so that means the rights to use data can be subject to and scope by an appropriate use license. That doesn't mean you're not a controller of the data. Um, so I see a lot of people go, oh, well, we own the data, so you can't be a controller. And that's just not a valid argument because the, the identification of you as a controller is, um, you know, maps to your compliance obligations under the GDPR. It doesn't map to your IP rights necessarily. Yeah, I think that on ownership concept can get a bit confusing. Mm. They'll say we are the owner of this and therefore sure. you control you can't do what you want. And it's not the same, is it? No. Yeah. No. You may be the owner, but you but what you do is you agree that as a controller you need to use it for these use <coughs> cases. And so that becomes almost a commercial discussion over the, the scope of your license to use the data. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just in terms of those contract terms, um, it doesn't necessarily your ability to restrict the, the process or the, the controller and what they what they do as your service provider doesn't necessarily end when the when the contract ends. So yeah. you can get into those contract terms. You can you can get audits. You can you can you can make that controller. Or if you are a service provider that is a controller, think about how you can you can you know put that put the other party's mind at ease when, once you're in contract life by making audit reports available, showing that you know you're you're not actually you know, selling their data to North Korea or, or, or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, <laughs> think, yeah. think about that that in life. So that's a really important point. And so I know it's running out of time, but I think this is worth just ma making this point. That it's actually really important, especially in a joint controller arrangement, because now you're jointly responsible. And often people, I see a lot of times when a, a customer will say, we want you to be a processor. And then when you say, no, I'm a controller, their fallback is fine, we'll, we'll be joint controllers, because it feels more comfortable, because it feels like you have more control over the data. But actually, remember, now you're just making yourself jointly and severally liable for that data processing, maybe unnecessarily, because you're not actually joint controllers and what that means is that your service provider now has a legitimate right to do an audit of your processing because now they're on the hook so each party now needs to have reciprocal audit rights they need to have a much deeper understanding of how the data is being processed because guess what they're on the hook for that data jointly and severally vis-a-vis -vis the data subject so it's not it, it feels like the right thing to do because you're maintaining control but remember you can still exercise that control in an independent to independent control relationship without exposing yourself to that 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 kind of liability issue. So moving on, I'm conscious of the time. Our next question is, I'm a processor, may I engage a controller? Um, and also, Flick, I think you're going to deal with this, but can you give us some examples of what we're thinking of here? Yeah, so short answer, yes. Again, I get this a lot. I'm a processor. I can't, um, you know, processors trying to engage a service provider that's saying they are a controller. So example that I see, you know, controller is providing payment processing services. Uh, service provider is maybe providing fraud prevention services or detection services, those kind of examples. And the processor goes, well, no, you can't be a controller because we're a processor. So how can we possibly engage you as a controller? And actually, um, the fact that you've got a processor trying to engage a controller doesn't take away from the fact that that service provider is still a controller. But it just means that that processor, who, remember, can only act on the instructions of the ultimate controller they're engaged by, has to go back to that controller and say, look, we need to get instructions from you to engage this third party controller. And so the processor can do it, but they would have to make sure that they've got the necessary instructions from the ultimate controller to go and engage that third party controller yeah it, it comes up a lot in ad tech as well because yeah. everyone's a bit confused about their role but they think they can't pass it down yeah um next question do i have to get data subject um, a data, data subject to consent to share data with another controller and as receiving controller should i insist that the first data controller has sought consent okay so as quick as i can for the first question um the thing to remember is that, that when you're sharing or disclosing data, um, you know, one of the misconceptions here is that when, when you disclose data to another controller, you need the data subject's consent or the individual's consent for doing that. That's 
Absolutely not the case. So, so your disclosure or your sharing of data is is just a another form of, of processing. So, like any form of processing, um, you can you can have one of several um, legal bases um, that that you base that processing on. Consent, um, consent being being one of them. But the thing to remember with with consent, if you're if you're getting individuals' consent to share their data, is that it does have to be a true consent that they're informed about that they can withdraw um, at any time so i mean what i would say is that in, in most cases uh controller to controller sharing does not need um data subject consent rather it it, it needs you, you need to provide notice of it in your privacy notice um and obviously all of the other things that flow with with being a being a controller um but the thing to remember is that they're, they're there will be instances where depending on what the receiving controller wants to do with the data where they will need the disclosing controller um, to to get that consent or, or to otherwise establish the uh, the legal basis to to enable their their processing so I, I won't I won't labor on this but obviously if, if the receiving controller is intending to to send electronic marketing um, with with the data that they get, then they need the they need the disclosing controller to have got consent to enable that that electronic the, the sending of the electronic marketing communications. That's even if your your legal basis for sending for, for marketing generally is your own legitimate interest as a controller. You will still need the consent to send that electronic marketing communication. Um, and then the other the other big category is if, if the disclosure involves any any special categories of data or, or sensitive categories of data, criminal record um, information, etc. Um, which yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well that can be tricky when there's no um, direct relationship between the receiving controller and the data subject. Yeah. yeah indeed. Yeah. That is, um, um, which leads us neatly on to <laughs> the last question. So we're, we're running, probably going to run slightly over time, but if you're okay to bear with us, then great. Um, otherwise, we will circulate um, some, some written points on these questions. But if, if I'm a behind the scenes controller um, service provider, how do I comply with my notice obligations? Yeah, this is an absolutely tricky and thorny issue. And the same, um, and Elvin touched upon it a bit with the consent issue as well. So if you've received data from another controller um, and you're an independent controller, you're now independently responsible for one, justifying your um, processing under one of the lawful grounds in the GDPR and also making sure that you've given the data subject notice of your data processing. Now, if that data has come from another party, so you didn't correct, um, collect it directly, uh, your notice obligation sits under Article 14.1 of the GDPR, which means that you've basically got a month to tell that data subject everything you need to tell them under the GDPR, um, i.e. get notice to them. Um, and there are some limited exceptions to this rule. For example, if uh, the you know if they've already been told about the data processing that you're going to do, then you wouldn't have to go and give them notice. There are some other exceptions if it would involve disproportionate eff um, effort or would be impossible or would seriously impair the objectives of the processing. But when you start to dig into those, they have fairly limited scope. So basically, you're kind of going to rely on the fact that, that hopefully that they've already been told about the processing because you've contractually required the sharing controller to try and get notice and push notice down on your behalf. And that's how most people try and do it. If you don't have a direct interface, you're ultimately reliant on that relationship you have with the other controller to try and get them to get, get the notice down. Now, practically, many of those sharing controllers will go, hold up, we cannot possibly get all the notice and the detail that you require because now our privacy policy starts to get absolutely overloaded with you know notice language um, that relates to your processing so usually you know practically speaking probably the best you're going to get from the sharing controller is for them to um, you know best case scenario they will identify you specifically in their notice and ideally they include a link to your privacy notice Good luck with that. Many people won't agree to that, but it's worth a shot. 
The second option is um, they at least broadly identify you. Um, and so you've got some notice. Again, it's not perfect because you haven't fully addressed all your notice obligations. Or, and, it, and if you haven't fully addressed it, you've somehow got to find a way then to follow up within a month and try and get that notice out to the uh, to the data subjects. And how you do that will, you know, will depend on your ability to directly interface with them. But again, if you if you can't directly interface with them, then a lot of people end up kind of taking a risk on that notice obligation and at a bare minimum, making sure that they've got a public facing privacy notice that does cover off all the notice points. And it's something that they can point to as their kind of first line of defense. It's not perfect, but it's something. And then kind of contractually trying to get some minimum notice um, commitments in the sharing controllers privacy policy. Um, but it, it's a really tricky issue and many people haven't got this fully buttoned up and, and I work with a lot of ad tech companies and it's really difficult to get that notice, especially if you are a controller who's maybe two or three steps removed from the data subjects and now you're relying on a chain of kind of goodwill through the contracts to try and get that notice obligation addressed. Sorry, we've run out of time. So yeah, we've run over. We'll bring it to an end there. Um, we've managed to get through all of the questions. And I think we've actually managed to cover off most of the questions that we've received in during the webinar. Um, thanks very much for engaging in that way. We're going to do another one in about a month's time. Um, and I believe we're going to cover managing data breaches. Um, we'll circulate um, a placeholder date um, along with these slides and some, some written answers to these questions. But thank you again for, um, for listening in. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take me a while to figure out how to stop it. <laughs>